Let's start. We're in the book of Job. We're doing a, an expository study on the book of Job. Um, uh, I like the book of Job. This is our fourth part in this series on Job. And it's, it's, uh, it's um, probably one of the most defining books on the spiritual war that goes on that there is in the Bible. It's the oldest book ever written. Let's just start with Job chapter 1, verse 1. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and escheweth evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the highest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sat and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Verse 5. And it was so when the days of their fasting were gone about. Feasting. Excuse me, feasting. Let me start at verse 5 over. And it was so when their days of feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This did Job continually. So uh, last week we looked at specific characteristics that the Bible uses to define integrity. Um, wouldn't you like to be known as a person of integrity? Wouldn't you like people to say, man, that, that, that guy has integrity or that gal has integrity? Well, the Bible shows us what integrity is. And we show four specific traits of those who have in, in, integrity. And they included, we're not going to preach them again. But the first thing is that you fear God. You, you know, one of the things that leads to a lack of integrity is no fear of God. Amen. You don't see any ramifications for any bad decision that you make, and you don't fear God. And we have a church age that does not fear God. <laughs> Christians that don't fear God. And you say, well, wait a second, preacher. Once you get saved, you don't need to fear God anymore because he's your father. <laughs> I ain't feared my dad the whole time I was growing up. Kept me out of a lot of trouble, amen? amen? You're supposed to fear God whether you're saved or whether you're lost. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, amen? amen. amen. So the second thing, that characteristic of somebody that has integrity is somebody that eschews evil. Now the word eschews is one of those old archaic King James words that nobody could possibly figure out what it means. It simply means to flee from, to shun, or to avoid. <laughs> it's not that tough, folks. There's hardly any really archaic words in the King James Bible. But when you do come across, when they make this thing called a uh, dictionary, <laughs> you can actually look them up. Preacher, that's too much work for me. You don't fear God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The third characteristic was to walk uprightly. The Bible says that we're supposed to stay away from even the appearance of evil. Even the appearance of evil. So what is your testimony worth to you? Is it worth, you know, somebody, somebody cheated you and you can get back at them and they cheated you out of 20 bucks and you can get back at them? Is your testimony worth 20 bucks? Maybe sometimes you just write that stuff off and say, oh, well, my testimony is not worth 10,000 bucks because people watch us. And we talked about that. We talked about how we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses that are watching our every move. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have kids that may, may or may not be saved. We have uh, kids that may be saved and not walking with the Lord and they're watching us. I praise God that my oldest boy is now uh, preaching, but he walked away from God for a period of time and probably the thing that drove this exact point home to me more than anything else when he got right with God he called me and he said I just couldn't get over your faithfulness all these years you never wavered 
there was enough family pressure that you should have caved and you didn't. Mm -hmm. What's your testimony worth today? Amen? Amen. You're being watched whether you know you're being watched or whether you don't know you're being watched. You're being watched. Yes. One of the greatest compliments that I ever got was when I was in business and moving from city to city getting promotions and I started off in Boise and I went to Washington State and I came back to Boise as their postmaster because I was my government, my job, my secular job was with the Postal Service. When I came back to Boise as their postmaster, a letter carrier made an appointment to come and see me. When he came in to see me, he said, I just want you to know I got saved. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear you got saved. He goes, but I wanted you to know why. Okay, what well, cause? Give me your testimony. Why you get saved? He said, all the time that you were my supervisor, I watched you. And I was looking for something that you did wrong. I was looking for some reason not to believe. And there wasn't one. Now, in my opinion, God blinded his eyes to some stuff. That's my opinion, amen? amen. But for whatever reason, he looked at me and my testimony was such that he eventually turned his life over. What a compliment, amen? amen. It's not that I'm a great person, folks, but we do serve a great God. Amen. And uh, so what is your testimony over? The fourth item that ruffles up Christian's feathers today, the fourth item of integrity is that you obey all civil authority and rules that are not in conflict with this book. Yeah. Well, preacher, I don't like that. Tough beans. It's biblical. It doesn't matter whether you like it, whether you don't like it. It's biblical, and you're supposed to obey civil authorities. The Bible's very clear on that. Unless... It violates the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So when you're talking about obeying civil authorities, it seems like the question always comes out, okay, well, what about the mark of the beast? What, when, what are we going to do when the government tells us to take the mark of the beast? You didn't listen to the entire statement if you're asking that question because that's an easy question to answer. Taking the mark of the beast is in conflict with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You obey civil authorities unless they're in conflict with the word of God. If they come in conflict with the word, listen, if the government passes a law that says we can't meet as a church anymore, we're still going to meet as a church. Amen. Now, you may choose not to come, and that shows your lack of integrity. Amen? Mm -hmm. It may be that we go underground and we hide as we meet. I'm not sure that I'd be willing to do that, though. I might be willing to go to jail and meet anyhow because of the testimony that that would provide. So there's four elements, biblical elements to integrity. So there's going to be bigger decisions, though, that are a little bit grayer. That we're going to have to struggle with this. Times get worse and times get better. Uh, what if the government mandates the vaccine? Where are you going to draw the line in the sand? Is that something that you're going to draw the line in the, line in the sand with? I'm not going to give you an answer to that. That's something between you and God. Amen. What if uh, you have to choose between taking the shot or losing your job? Well, there's people all over the country who are saying, take my job. I'm not getting the shot. Amen. Yeah. Amen. What if you're allowed not to go into grocery stores anymore unless you have your little... Uh, <coughs> what they call it, uh, passport, your little electronic passport showing that you... Vaccination validation. Vaccination validation. The truth of the matter is, I could give you a million what ifs. What if they do this? What? And that doesn't, that's not fruitful, folks. You're wasting time if you're worried about what ifs. Wait until it comes to pass. I, as a preacher, had to, had, have had to deal with people that have all kinds of insecurity issues and people that get frazzled about things going on around them and stuff. And one of the best tools that I've ever done with people who are overly nervous about things, I tell them, take an envelope and a piece of paper and write down the 10 things that you're most concerned about right now, the things that you think are going to just ruin your life. Write them down on a piece of paper, put them in that envelope, seal it, write the date on the envelope, and in three months, open up that envelope and read it. And you'll have a good laugh, because most of the things that you are totally worried about never came to pass. Mm -hmm. Never came to pass. So let's don't worry about all those what ifs. 
Let's worry about it when it becomes a reality and not a what if, amen? And then we approach it prayerfully and we trust the, go the Holy Spirit to lead us in all matters of truth. Amen. So the Bible gives us an answer in Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew 6 and uh, chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. Here's the answer. I told you I wasn't going to give you the answer. Now I'm giving you the answer. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Uh, verse 25. Twenty-six. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Mm -hmm. You know, I need the Bible to tell me that I'm better than a bird. I do need that. The birds don't disobey God. Have you ever disobeyed God? A bird doesn't disobey God. If God tells a bird to do something, the bird does it. Verse 27, which of you taking thought can add one cubic unto his statue, stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Mm -hmm. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought of the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Mm -hmm. There's your answer, folks. And you may want to mark this in your Bible because you may, as we're going up, if, listen, if folks on the internet, if you missed Sunday school, you should go back and listen to it. We're definitely in the end times and as things can progressively get worse, this is a portion of scripture that you may need to go back and refer to from time to time. So back to our text in Job chapter 1. And I uh, I tossed it so I have to look it up again. Job chapter 1 and look at verse 2. It says, And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Job had seven sons and three daughters. Pretty good sized family, huh? We talked about Agenda 21 in Sunday school. Job wouldn't be able to have seven sons and three daughters because after three kids, they would uh, force a sterilization process. So we need to pay particular attention to what Job possesses because we're coming back down to what Job possessed. And according to Job 42.10, Job gets twice as much after he goes through this period of trying than he had prior to this period of trying. He came out on the other side and God blessed him. Now that's a picture of somebody going through the tribulation and then when they make it through the tribulation going to heaven and they get double blessed for making it through there, amen? Mm -hmm. And so when God makes the statement that he's uh, gonna give Job twice as much as he had before, he's not talking about kids because I checked that out. You know what God gave him? And God gave him exactly what he had before. He restored his family, seven sons and three daughters. Gave him exactly what he had before. So uh, when we get to verse three, there's a couple of things to notice. Verse three says, his substance also was 7,000 sheep. Now we're not gonna turn there, but if you went to Job 42, 12, he now has 14,000 sheep. Also 3,000 camels, Job 14. 42 verse 12, it went up to 6,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen went to 1,000 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses, it went to 1,000 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So here Job is identified as the greatest 
of all the men of the east. Isn't that significant? Yes. He was the greatest of all the men of the east. That means that Job came from the east. He was a Shemite. A Shemite. Uh, there's Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And the Europeans are Japheth. Of course, there's it's mixed up now because any of the black race is ham. So you can have nowadays you can have a black European and he's not a he's not Japheth, but true European ancestry is is Japheth. Ham is all the black races and Shem is all the brown races. So Shem would include Mexicans, Hispanics, I guess. I'm not I'm probably not politically correct, but it would include Hispanics, it would include Italians, it would include Jews, it would include Arabs, amen. Mm -hmm. Asians, amen, men of the East. So he was he was the greatest of the men of the East. Some people get lost in the descendants of Noah where it pertains to Israel. Some people don't follow that stuff out. You know, the Bible's a very profound book and you if you want to understand stuff, you need to follow it out. Amen? And so some people think that Shem just refers to Israel. Well, you don't understand your Bible. You need to dig in deeper. You had Noah well before Israel, so Job is a Shemite. But we must take note of the fact that he existed prior to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he has descendants that are not of Israel. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So the Bible refers to the descendants of Abraham as sojourners, as pilgrims, as strangers. Doesn't refer to the Asians as that. What does Asians include when you say something like Asians? What does that include? It includes Indians, mm -hmm. Japanese, Chinese. Amen? Amen. Eskimos. I don't know if it's Eskimos, does it? Does, are yeah. Eskimos Asians? Yeah. yeah, my wife's saying yeah, and she studies this stuff. So Eskimos are Asians. That's cool. I never knew that, brother. Thank you for throwing that in. So they were considered sojourners, pilgrims, and strangers. But based on our verse here, that's not the case for Job. He wasn't a sojourner. He wasn't a stranger. He wasn't a pilgrim. He was the greatest of all the men of the East, according to the Bible. The great, not a great, not a great man, but the greatest of all the men of the East. Um, Job lived in a city and he was one of the elders who sits in judgment in the circuit court of that city. That's significant too, don't you think? Mm -hmm. You say, where do you get that? Keep your fingers here and turn to Job chapter 31. I don't just make stuff up, folks. Job chapter 31, and man, I keep turning way too many pages. And look at verse uh, 21. Job 30, uh, I was looking at it, I go, that doesn't work, and I was looking at Job 30. Look at Job 31, verse 21. If I lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate. So he was... A judge, and if he lifted up his hand against the fatherless in his judgment, he's making a comment about that. Amen. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about Job, we're not talking about some novice that didn't understand the rules of the land. We're not talking about some novice that didn't understand how to invest. We're not talking about some novice that didn't know how to raise his kids. He took care for his kids. Amen. Amen. He probably took better care for his kids than many of us do for our kids because he's offering sacrifices just in case they sinned and they didn't confess to it. I'm going to offer sacrifices for them mm -hmm. because I'm worried about my kids. I'm, I'm concerned about my kids' eternal destination. He's not a novice. To suffice it to say that when the Bible calls somebody great, they're great. <laughs> God doesn't use terms like that lightly. Amen. Amen. There's some folks that we look at and think they were great men of God that the Bible doesn't say that they were great. So are they great? Don't know. I know that our ways are not God's ways. And we might look at somebody and think they're great. And God may say they're not great at all. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
So you can rest assured when God made Solomon's wisdom exceed all the children in the east country, and he did that in 1 Kings 4.30. We're not turning there, but I give you the reference in case you want to look it up. When God made Solomon's wisdom exceed all the children of the east country, east, he took them to the book of Job for his first lesson in vanity of vanities. All is vanity. He took them to Job. Yeah, these books are given to us for reasons. These books aren't just something that we can look and say, oh, that's kind of a cute little history lesson. They're given to us for spiritual reasons, for spiritual discernment, for spiritual growth. So let's turn our attention back to Job chapter 1 and let's look at verse 4. It says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat, and to drink with them. So verse 4 talks to us about feasting in their houses. One, everyone in his day. Don't you find that wording a little peculiar? Everyone in his day. It's probably referring to birthday parties. They went to their brother's house feasting everyone in his day. What is your day? <laughs> What is there? To, they're probably talking about, I don't know for sure, but that makes sense that they'd be talking about birthday parties. Everyone on their day, they went and met with the brothers in the houses and they had a feast. The Job's, are da uh, the Job's daughters are invited to eat and drink with their brothers, but by all appearances, Job's family is a very close-knit family. They do a lot of things together. Now, I don't want to hurt my mom's feelings because she listens to my preaching every, every meeting, but the Day family's not a close-knit family. It just isn't. I wish, I kind of wish it was, but some people, when you say, well, we're not a close family, some people go, oh, I've never known anything different. It doesn't, it, I don't sit way awake at night worried about it, but, you know, my oldest brother, I do love him. I'm not going to say I don't love him, but Lisa and I have been married for a long time, and I think that Lisa's only seen him twice. Is that about right, Lee? Mm -hmm. So she's seen him twice. I probably haven't talked to him in, man, probably pushing 10 years now, probably. Uh, it's not a close family. Job's family wasn't like that. Job's family was close. Now, I think a close family is better than a family that's not close. But you know something that tears a family apart? Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. From this day forth, a house will be divided, two against one and one, or two against three and three against two. Yep. The father will be against the son and the son against the father, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. This book divides. This book separates. And God's expectation is you take a stand on the book. And if that separates your family, that separates your family, Amen. Amen. And uh, it's not an unusual circumstance to see a family. Uh, I would say, <laughs> you always get in trouble when you start preaching about family, but I would say Lisa's family, for the most part, is a close-knit family. They get together for different things. Lisa no longer fits in. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. She no longer fits in. She became a Christian. They're Catholic. And uh, one of the last big get-togethers that she went to, her brother-in-law said, we want fun Lisa back. We want fun. <laughs> Lisa's fun, folks. <laughs> and uh, we want fun Lisa back. So uh, these parties most likely were genuine times of joy and thanksgiving. They probably truly enjoyed each other's company. <clears throat> they probably truly enjoyed being getting together. And they were probably true times of thanksgiving, not just for what they had, but to God, amen? By all appearances, this family was a godly family. And we see uh, some good parenting skills by looking at verse 5 where it says, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, It may be, that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. 
Thus did Job continually. <laughs> That's some good parenting skills. Talking to your kids about spiritual matters. Now listen, a, a kid has to be willing to receive that in order for it to take place because that whole thing about division is a true thing. You're probably got people in your family that if you tried contacting them and talking to them about spiritual things, it'd be a very brief conversation because they don't want to hear spiritual things. Amen. Amen. And that's sad. But that's the world we live in because there is a God of this world. Amen. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. And so uh, Job's not going to take any chances with his family. I don't think that this was something that, because if you look at verse 5, it says that Job sent and sanctified them. It isn't something that he tried to do at his own personal altar, thinking that he could be a substitutionary spiritual blessing for his kids. No, he sent it to his kids for the purpose of the sanctification. And so he's not taking any chances. I'm not sure that my son will think on his own to take this lamb and to sacrifice it. So I'm going to send a lamb that's without spot and blemish to him mm -hmm. that he can sanctify himself and that he can so offer that lamb for his sins. Amen? Amen. So Job, Job is familiar with the human race. He knows what's inside man. He doesn't just take for granted that his kids are going to do right. He doesn't just take for granted that his morals are going to automatically rub off on his kids because if you're a parent, you have undoubtedly at some point experienced the frustration of a kid's morals not lining up with what you believe you've tried your best to teach them. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. And we live in this very dangerous time. We talked about it last Wednesday night. We live in this very dangerous time where the school system has your kid for five to six hours a day and you're lucky if you interact with them an hour a day. So who has the biggest influence on your kids? Church. Amen. The school. <laughs> I wish it was the church. We have them for three hours a week maybe. Gonna go to four hours a week, amen? So tough times for a parent that, that wants to teach their kid to love God. Now, I'm saying you can still do it, but you're not going to be doing it by taking a passive role in your kid's life. Job didn't take a passive role. Job got involved. <laughs> he knew what was in man. He knew, as good as I've raised my kids, they might curse God in their heart. Send them a sacrifice. Says to his servants, you know, take this over to Job Jr. He may have done something wrong and take this to him so that he can make sure that he's right. Now, we see a case where David was going to make a sacrifice for the people, and somebody said, hey, take my oxen, take the, take the uh, yoke that's on the oxen so that you have wood and go ahead and offer them. Uh, that's the least I could do for you. And what was David's response? No, he, he said, I'll pay the full price for them because I'm not going to offer to God something that costs me nothing. You know, there has to be a, a cost to you or it's kind of meaningless. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So at the end of the parties, Job offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So seven sons and three daughters, he offered ten offerings. Amen? It certainly appears that the Lord accept these offerings because of what he instructs Job, Job's three friends at the close of the book. Let's look at that real quick. Just Hold your hand here and turn to Job 42. Job 42 and look at verse 8. Job's friends that came to comfort him, God tells them, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So all appearances are, God kind of liked Job. God liked Job's heart. 
And God wanted his friends to offer a sacrifice to Job that Job will pray for them because God said, I'll listen to Job. I ain't listen to y'all, but I'll listen to Job. And uh, Job did the right thing and he prayed for his friends, amen. amen. And so what a thing. Something to make note of is that rising early in the morning to do sacrifices to the Lord existed well before Abraham. People want to think that the sacrifice of lambs, and I've shown before, I'm not going to do it again today, but I've shown before that that's what God sacrificed for Adam and Eve in the garden. That's what um, um, Abel sacrificed to the Lord that was acceptable, a lamb. And that sacrifice of lambs existed well before Abraham was even born. That's something that God made clear to his creation. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to uh, Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one who feareth God, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not thine hand so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You know, something that always strikes me about that when I read it. Satan got exactly what he wanted, right? He wanted to be able to go after Job. And he told, if you let me go after Job, he's going to curse you to his face. And God said, okay, go ahead and do it. Satan didn't so much as say thank you. <laughs> as soon as he gets given permission, boom, he's gone and he's going to start right now. Yeah. He's been itching to get after Job. He likes the idea of getting after Job. He wants to afflict Job. He hates Job. Does Satan hate you? He hates me. Man, I see it all the time how he hates me. <laughs> Amen. But God loves me. You know, one of the best hymns ever written, real tough hymn. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. What a good hymn. And that only applies to Christians, folks. The Bible says he hates all workers of iniquity. He hates all workers of iniquity. If you're not saved, you're a worker of iniquity. That just sticks in the craw of Christians today because God loves everybody. Witness to somebody, they reject Christ and they spit in God's face and they say, God loves you. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> God's wrath is abiding on you. Amen. 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 So a new character enters the scene in this little portion of scripture. It's a guy that's known as the accuser of the brethren. Yes. Mm -hmm. Keep your hand here and turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The accuser of the brethren. You see, Satan accused Job, and Job hadn't even done anything yet. Satan says, if you do this, he's going to curse you to your face. Is that an accusation? Look at Revelation 12, look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Boy, he's busy just accusing folks in front of God. Sometimes we give him his ammunition, right? Sometimes we do things that it's easy for him to go up and say, hey, did you see Pastor Day down there in Alamos? Did you see what he did? Did you see him yelling at that driver in front of him? 
God says no. Yeah, God says, uh, I saw it and I told him that that's the person he's trying to lead to me. And he repented. And so I don't even remember it anymore. So you're right. God says no. No, I didn't see that. But he's the accuser of the brethren. If you're if somebody likes to go around saying, did you see what Brian did? You're taking Satan's job because it's not your job to accuse the brethren. That's Satan's job. Amen. Amen. So obviously the devil, that old dragon, Satan, is the accuser of the brethren. But he is also the second most discussed person in the Bible. Did you ever stop to think about that? Who's the most discussed person in the Bible? Jesus. Jesus. Who's the second most discussed person in the Bible? Satan. Because the battle is between good and evil. That's something Hollywood got right. There is a battle going on between good and evil. There's a rebellious creation of God. Satan was created. You know what Satan's got this world duped into right now? Did you know that the uh, lion's share of people, not that it's not the majority yet, but it's going to be the majority. All the secret societies, all the satanic cults, they believe that Lucifer, they literally believe that Lucifer is the good one. Yes. And that Elohim is the bad one. That Lucifer, the bearer of light, came to give light to people, to help them, to help them evolve into something better. Whereas Elohim tries to hold people back and keep light from them. What a mixed up world we live in. Elohim is eternal. <laughs> God Almighty is eternal. God was always. Mm -hmm. He wasn't created by anything. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. Amen. Satan is a creation of God. Yes. He was not eternal. There was a point in time, and I would guess it was December 25th, that God created Satan. He created that being, but he didn't create him as the devil. He created him as the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the second most powerful being in creation. And he got a big head. He was the anointed cherub that covered. He was up over God's throne watching all the praise and adulation that God got from all of his creation. And he said, I want that for me. Bible says he was the most beautiful creation. Yep. He was something that you'd look at and say, oh my gosh. You know, a type of him in the Bible is this character named Absalom. And the Bible talked about the beauty of Absalom. And his I imagine Satan has really long hair because Absalom had really long hair, right? Mm -hmm. It was his hair that was his downfall, got tangled up in the trees as he went under the trees. You say, and preacher, are you saying anybody with long hair is a devil? I would never say that because that's nonsense. You know, I've actually seen preachers that were so nonsensical that they said Jesus did, was clean shaved and never wore long hair. And yet the Bible tells you that they plucked his beard out by the roots. He was not clean shaved. You know, somebody that says something stupid like that, they don't read their Bible. The Bible talks about him how he was a Nazarite. He didn't cut his hair. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus had long hair. He had a beard. And um, he says, so what's your position on hair? I don't have a position on hair. <laughs> Amen. I don't have a position. So there's 18 types of the Antichrist in the Bible. There's 18 different types of the Antichrist. I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm not going to teach a message on the Antichrist. But there's 18 types. Um, he is not afraid of any human being. Satan the idea that Satan is afraid of, he's the second most powerful being that was ever created. He did not shake at the words of Apostle Paul. You say, well, what about Jesus? Jesus was God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they would fall down and worship him because they had no choice, because they knew he was God. The demons would. Amen? Amen. And so there's not a human that ever walked the face of the earth. What about D.L. Moody? Devil wasn't afraid of D.L. Moody. What about Martin Luther? The devil wasn't afraid of Martin Luther. Yeah. What about Pastor Day? The devil's definitely not afraid of me. <laughs> Amen? Amen. 
He's not afraid of any human being, but you know what he is afraid of? The power of Jesus Christ, the power of the blood. You can call down the blood of Jesus Christ and defeat the devil. Not if you're lost. You know what happens if you're lost? If, you, if you're lost and you come across a demon-possessed person that you know is demon-possessed and you say in the name of Jesus Christ, you know what they're going to say? Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> because you're nothing, because you're not even saved. You're not sanctified. You don't have the blessing of God upon you. The only way you can be effective at, at calling on the power of the Holy Ghost and Paul calling on the power of the blood of Jesus Christ in a demonic warfare, the only way that you can have any success in that is by first accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Amen. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're undone. You have no power. You're a little wimpy. You know, they used to do a trash bag commercial. Wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. That's you if you're not saved. You're wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. And the devil's not afraid of you. Never has been afraid of you. And I don't care if you're saved and sanctified and walking a holy life. He's not afraid of you either. You know what he's afraid of? He's afraid of you calling on your Savior Amen. to fight your battle for you. Amen. When I pray, I do pray for power. I pray for power of my preaching. I pray for power in my walk. But when I pray, because I know there's a battle going around in this valley, there is a big spiritual battle going on in this valley. Satan's had control of this valley for decades and he doesn't want to give it up. And when I pray for that power, I pray, God Almighty, please send your reinforcements. Amen. 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 Send your angelic host to fight the battle for us. Amen. Because I'm insufficient. And everybody sitting in this room is insufficient. The man, if we got on our knees and prayed for the power of God and for his heavenly host to come down and fight that battle in this valley, we'd start seeing some results. Listen, we're not going to see revival anymore. We're in the end times. But there can be a pocket of folks being plucked out of the fire. Amen? Amen. I'd like to see some people pulled out of the fire here in Alamosa Preacher. before the end times come. Amen. Amen. Where's our prayer life? Mm -hmm. Where is your power? Because Satan's not worried about your power. Satan's not worried about my preaching. The man when the Holy Ghost gets in it. Listen, if you're going to pray for this preacher, pray that the Holy Ghost will get involved in the preaching. Pray that the Holy Ghost will give the power from on high. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And I'm not talking about in a charismatic way. I'm not talking about this phony nonsense. I watched a preacher the other day, and he was, he's, he's not a charismatic, and he, he's been, uh, I, I got a question of a guy's ministry when their whole ministry is attacking a movement, and a he, his ministry has been attacking the charismatic movement. But I've been to a charismatic church where they try and teach you to speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Bible, there was nobody that was taught to speak in tongues. Amen. Amen. That's something that just came upon them. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. There was nobody that prayed and said, Lord, help me to speak in tongues. There's not a case in the Bible where somebody prayed to speak in tongues. You know what they hang their hat on? Paul from Southern Israel saying, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than y'all. <laughs> That's a joke, Southern y'all, because he says y'all. <laughs> Paul was glad, but you know what Paul said in that same dissertation? I'd rather speak one, tongue, one word of understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Mm -hmm. hmm. So this guy is talking about speaking in tongues, and you'll get a kick out of this, because I've been to a service where they try to teach you how to speak in tongues, and it's you got to work hard at not laughing as they're trying to teach you this because it's so stupid. You know, loosen your jaw up and start uttering sounds. And this guy says, here's speaking in tongues today. Bada Honda should have bought a Yamaha. <laughs> Bada Honda should have bought a Yamaha. <laughs> he basically said, 
And it's the truth. If you listen, if, and I've listened to a lot of preachers that are big TV evangelists that speak in tongues and they're part of the charismatic movement. If you listen to them and you go to a different date, listen to them again, go to a different date, you know what they're doing? They're re-uttering the same syllables, the same sounds. It's something that they became familiar with and they're just saying the same utterances. And you know what they did? Because at one point, the charismatic movement was saying, these unknown languages are real languages. Matter of fact, they had some folks that there wasn't a, a Japanese guy in the congregation or a Chinese guy in the congregation. It was Chinese, not Japanese. Wasn't a Chinese, Chinese guy in the congregation and they had some guys that started speaking in tongues that sounded like Chinese. And you know what the preacher said? We're going to send you guys to China because you can speak in tongues and you can go minister to those folks. You won't even have to study the language because you're already speaking in tongues and you're speaking Chinese. And you know what? They weren't speaking Chinese at all. <laughs> they headed over to China and then they just fought. Nobody could understand a single word they were saying. And so they had linguists come to some of these different services to listen, different linguists. And these linguists said, these are not languages. And so you know what the charismatic movement did? They said, oh, we're not speaking in languages. We're speaking in an unknown tongue, an angelic voice. Yeah. It's a lie. It's a seducing spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. What good is it if nobody understands it? Amen. That's what the Bible says. What good is it if nobody can understand it? So we have the accuser of the brethren. He's the second most powerful being. And he's not afraid of you. But greater is he that's in you. Amen. Than he that's in the world. Praise God. You don't have to go to battle against the devil in your own strength. And if you try, you're going to get your teeth kicked in. Yep. Because the Bible says, who can raise a spear against him? His, his scale, he's, he's a um, reptilian. His scales are so close to one another that air can't even get between them. Yep. He laughs at a dart. He laughs at arrows. He laughs when somebody shakes a spear at him. He's not afraid of us. But man, we have God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And God that spoke him into existence is going to defeat him. Mm -hmm. God could have spoke him out of existence, but he chose not to. And you say, why wouldn't he have just spoke him out of existence? Well, praise God he didn't because we would have never been created because we're part of that spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. But see, in that rebellion, a third of the angels went with him and God could have spoke all of them out of existence just like that. But he's surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. There's still two-thirds of the angels watching what's going on. Mm -hmm. And God says, there's a battle here, and I have something to prove. I have to prove that his rebellion is evil. You know what the Bible calls rebellion? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Amen. The father of witches. Amen. 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 Much as I'd love to go on, we're going to stop there. Uh